Hello and welcome to Seven Days of Science. Coming up in the news this week... See, what I've done is put add intro later in the script and then forgotten to add the intro later. So I don't know. Starting off the news this week, researchers have published a study in the journal Physical Review A about the development of a new method of determining the three-dimensional location of singular atoms. Imaging singular atoms on a two-dimensional plane is, naturally, far easier than doing it in three dimensions, as the viewable image will only be in two dimensions. Measuring this third dimension has often been a difficult task for those wishing to study some of the smallest building blocks of our universe, and this team hopes to have solved this problem. Atoms viewed under a quantum gas microscope are eventually encouraged to emit light, and these scientists have found a way to deform the wavefront dependent on how distant the atom is from the camera viewing it, meaning that through observing this deformation, we can work out the distance between these atoms on this elusive third axis. This is a very important step in atom observation and quantum technology. Using this new method, it would now be far easier to simulate the characteristics of a proposed new material without having to construct it, saving time, resources, and allowing scientists to be more efficient as they further investigate the atom. In other news, a study published in the journal Nature Astronomy has taken a look at oxygen production on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. Europa is often thought of as a possible candidate for life in our solar system, as are a few of the other moons of our gas giants. Part of the reason for this is the amount of oxygen that it is believed lies under its icy surface. This study has taken another look at previous measurements and come to the conclusion that less oxygen is likely produced under the surface, decreasing the likelihood that life would be able to survive on the planet. Europa's surface, as the study remarks, is particularly affected by the space around it. It is often subject to charged particles, ultraviolet light and meteoroid impacts, which is why its surface is quite different from what you would expect looking at the moon by itself. The study used data from NASA's Juno spacecraft, which carried out a flyby of the Moon in September of 2022. Some data was also gathered as Juno passed closer to Europa while on its primary mission, and other data sources were looked at as well, such as that from the Galileo spacecraft that ended its mission in 2003. The researchers did acknowledge that there are many constraints on the observations they can make, which is of course part of the reason why this study is important, because we're using the data we have to try to understand the data we don't. Understanding oxygen production on bodies like this can help us understand other similar worlds as well, and the study calculated that around 12 kilograms of oxygen was produced on Europa's surface every second. To give a quick idea of how that compares to previous predictions, it was believed that this number could be anywhere from 5 to 1100 kilograms of oxygen production a second, so it's definitely at the lower end of that old model. Yet another fascinating study then on one of the gas giant moons. We've been lucky to be treated to quite a few recently. Also in the news, a recently published article describes the amazing feat of an orca preying upon a sub-adult great white shark. The incident occurred on the 18th of June 2023 in Mosul Bay, which is located around 400 kilometers east of Cape Town in South Africa's Western Cape Province. Luckily, two boats were in the vicinity and video footage was taken of the event. The orca was observed to grip the left pectoral fin of the shark and thrust forward with the shark several times before eventually eviscerating it. The orca was then seen with a bloody piece of peach-coloured liver in its mouth. There are known to be a few orcas which, working as a team, hunt sharks in Mosul Bay. The two that have been most frequently observed carrying out this behaviour are two males called Port and Starboard, so named due to the way in which their dorsal fins flop over. The remarkable thing about this sighting is that only one orca, Starboard, was observed attacking the shark and the whole episode from the orca approaching the shark to it being seen eating its liver was over in two minutes. The other male, Port, stayed about 100 metres away from Starboard as the attack happened. 
Upon their arrival, the observers reported an oily slick in the area, along with a strong odour of liver, suggesting that an attack had already occurred on a different shark. The carcass of an eviscerated shark was later found washed ashore. Perhaps Port has already had his lunch. Orcas never cease to amaze. They are majestic, formidable creatures with such an array of hunting techniques, and we look forward to more revelations about Port and Starboard in the future. If you would like to know more about these particular orcas hunting sharks or learn about some of their other hunting techniques, Ben's mum has some videos on them, and the links to these are in the description. First up in the paleontology news this week, there's some bad news for fans of the recently discovered Parasitus, an extinct whale which was named in August of last year and was hailed as potentially the most massive animal that had ever lived. This new study has examined different ways of estimating the body mass of this species and found that actually it did not exceed the body masses of modern blue whales, and therefore it was not the largest animal of all time. Parasitus colossus was discovered in approximately 38 million year old rocks in Peru and was described based on several incredibly thick vertebrae, ribs and part of the tiny pelvic girdle. It was a kind of basilosaurid whale related to the famous serpent-like basilosaurids. Related to the famous serpent-like basilosaurus. The paleontologists who described Parasitus estimated its total length at 17 to 20 meters and calculated its body mass of between 85 and 340 tons. These exceptional values were obtained using a method in which they first extrapolated the mass of the skeleton and then secondarily extrapolated the total body mass, assuming that the skeletal to body mass ratio was similar to modern whales, dugongs and manatees. However, this new study argues that questionable assumptions were made when estimating body mass, and using refined methods they present new values between 41.3 tonnes and 114 tonnes, but also state that the assumptions needed for estimating weights of more than 100 tonnes for Parasitus are unrealistic given its body plan, estimated length and the oceanic productivity of the Eocene Epoch. Within their estimated range, the authors state that 60 to 70 tons is probably the most likely body mass for this animal, which is still about 10 times larger than the estimates for Basilosaurus, and puts it at a similar size as modern sperm whales. However, they estimate maximum body masses of 270 tons for the absolute largest measured blue whales, so for now these incredible whales retain their title of largest animals ever. Parasitus is still an exceptional creature though, with incredibly thick and robust bones that point to an interesting ecological role, and hopefully more fossils will be discovered in the future that will help us better understand this animal and make more reliable estimates of its size. Also in the recent news is the very exciting naming and description of a bizarre new species of mosasaur from Morocco. Coming from rocks dating to the very end of the Cretaceous period, just before the mass extinction that wiped out the non-bird dinosaurs and many other lineages, including the mosasaurs themselves, it adds to our record of this incredibly diverse mosasaurid fauna. In fact, these latest Cretaceous Moroccan rocks represent the most diverse assemblage of these reptiles known at any time or place. This new species is known from a nice partial skull as well as some associated vertebrae and has been named Khinjaria Akuta. The name comes from the Arabic word Khinjar, meaning dagger, while Akuta is Latin for sharp, both in reference to the tooth anatomy. The skull shows that Khinjaria had enlarged dagger-like teeth at the front of its short and notably robust jaws, and the back part of its skull was actually elongated. This was therefore clearly an apex predator of its time, but its anatomy differs a great deal to the other large mosasaur predators such as Mosasaurus and Thalassotitan, indicating that it had a unique and specialised way of feeding on other animals. At about 8 metres in total length, it probably could have taken out other mosasaurs, in addition to sharks and smaller fish. Khinjaria forms a group with other mosasaur species so far only known from Africa, suggesting that these reptiles became highly regionally specialised at the end of the Cretaceous. It's an absolutely amazing new discovery. And finally for the recent paleo news, a new species of giant crab has been named from New Zealand. Dating to about 8.8 .8 million years ago, it belongs to the still-living genus Pseudococcinus, which includes the modern Tasmanian giant crab. 
Named as Pseudococcinus Rauben Heimeri, its name honours the collector and preparator of the fossils, Karl Raubenheimer. It's represented by six specimens and they are absolutely beautifully preserved in nodules, displaying amazing anatomical detail. This species actually possesses one of the largest crushing claws known for crabs, with their right major claws being well suited for getting through mollusk shells. These crabs will have inhabited a deep marine ecosystem, and another large crab species from this time period with big crushing claws has previously been described from New Zealand as well, indicating that the oceanic environment at this time and place was particularly favourable to such animals. Well, that's it for the news this week. I do hope you enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday.